section at the side of your screen. Um, we welcome your comments and we'll try and answer as many as we can. But first of all, I would like to say, um, introduce you to the panel and say a quick hello. Uh, Dr. Stephen D. Smith is the Finchie Viterbi Executive Director of the USC Shoah Foundation. And he holds the UNESCO Chair on Genocide Education. Welcome, Stephen. Yeah. Lena Srivastava is a social innovation strategist and the founder of CL, Creative Impact and Experience Lab. Hi, Lena. Hi, Jane. Hi. Clara Citron is a junior at New York University and the granddaughter of three Holocaust survivors. Well, happy to have you here, Clara. Thank you. And today's moderator, journalist and author Roger Cohen, is a veteran New York Times reporter, foreign editor, columnist, and as of this coming December, will be the Paris Bureau Chief. Welcome, Roger. Thank you, Jane. I'm so happy to have you all here. Thank you. In 1945, my grandfather, Sidney Bernstein, was among the liberators of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. He never would have imagined that I and my siblings would inherit a world still plagued by genocide and mass atrocities. It's a pretty awful, horrifying sight. People look more like animals than human beings. Dead bodies all over the place. And uh, smell, stench, went for miles. As you get nearer the camp, you could smell it. My instructions were to fill everything which would prove one day that this had actually happened. It'd be a lesson to all mankind as well. My grandfather's message is as urgent today as it was in 1945. We must permanently record the worst of our stories so that the truth will never be denied. This remains the work of three generations and the closing lines of my father's film are a touchstone for everything we do. Unless the world learns the lessons these pictures teach, then surely night will fall. But by God's grace, we who live will learn. Shot by Thorne McCann in 1945, some of which you have just seen, was filmed as the Russian British and the Americans liberated Nazi Germany. It would become my father Sidney Bernstein's film, German Concentration Camps Factual Survey. It's the foundation story of three generations. His documentary has had such a complex history that it has spawned three other documentaries and took 70 years to achieve a theatrical release. I'm proud that Three Generations has enabled its distribution in North America. Because of the pandemic, our commemoration of this 75th anniversary has had to change scope entirely since we first imagined it a year ago. But our goal remains the same, to engage young people with the truth about the Nazi atrocities and the awful history of the Holocaust through German concentration camps factual survey. Indeed, this year has only reminded us again and again how important it is to document evidence of crimes against humanity. This film and its legacy are deeply personal for me. Near the end of his life, my father told me that not being able to show his film and keeping its very existence a secret was his greatest regret. What he didn't tell me, and I only learned in the past couple of years, was that he had close family who died in the camps. Secrecy is a terrible burden. Today we commemorate the lives of those who were lost in those camps, and we honor those who survived. We also recognize the work of the people who documented the horrors found there and the efforts of everyone who has kept this evidence alive over the intervening dec decades. So today I'm really honored and thrilled um, 
to let our moderator, my old friend Roger Cohen, lead off the conversation on this anniversary. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you all today, especially because I've known Jane for more than 50 years. And I know that her passionate commitment to human rights is rooted in the film that her father produced on entering Bergen Belsen 75 years ago and going on to other camps in Germany like Dachau and Buchenwald. I also knew uh, her father, Sidney. He was, he was a remarkable man, the most gracious of men. Uh, he often had a wry smile. And I always felt with him, even being young, that he had, there was some deeper knowledge in him. I had that sense. And now that I know this film that he made and that had been kept secret for so long, I understand better why I had that feeling. We meet today at a dangerous time. Memory is fading of the Holocaust and I would say of the 20th century as a whole. Our president, Donald Trump, has, I think, given carte blanche to dictators and demagogues, nationalists and anti-Semites. He could not quite make up his mind about Charlottesville when the chant of Jews will not replace us went up from a band of white supremacists. And he's still not quite sure whether to denounce them. I myself have encountered an outpouring, a Twitter outpouring of anti-Semitic hatred toward me, zoning in on my name, Cohen, the likes of which I haven't seen ever, I think. Um, this followed a column I wrote called Trump's Last Stand for White America. Clearly those same white supremacists took offense and have been hurling abuse at me. So these people are out there, they're out there, Many of them are armed, and the possibility of chaos in the wake of the November 3 election is real. There's one other thing I would like to say, um, which is that I love the title of the movie that Sidney Bernstein produced, German Concentration Camps Factual Survey. There it is, totally unadorned, and in it is that word factual, it's about the facts. The facts count. The facts are important. When we lose sight of the barrier between truth and falseness, truth and lies, then we as a democratic society are lost. Unfortunately, and I don't want to have to say this, but President Trump has worked hard from day one to blur the line between fact and made up stuff. And of course, all that is compounded today by social media. So in conclusion, yes, it is a dangerous time. We need to be vigilant, we need to be aware, we need to be aware of the facts, and we need to be aware of history. And with that, Stephen, I will um, pass this along to you. Well, thank you, Roger, and uh, thank you, Jane, for the invitation to be here today. Um, you know, Sidney Bernstein knew something in 1945 that um, is quite remarkable, and that is that future generations will be faced with the issue of denial of a, an event that was so real and so potent at that particular moment in time. It was unthinkable that it would be un that it would be deniable. Um, just two weeks after, or last a week after, um, Facebook uh, announced that it was going to ban Holocaust denial, and Twitter followed suit a couple of days later. What we see is that uh, 75 years later, the prophecy that uh, was in, Sid in Sydney's intent um, is still there and still being realized through, in fact, um, these extremist viewpoints, which are both anti-Semitic um, and highly racially uh, and ideologically loaded. I want to go back in time for a moment uh, to um, when I was about 18, in fact, just a couple of years younger than our next guest, um, when I was um, living in England. Um, I had no connection to the Holocaust whatsoever through my family life. I grew up in a Christian uh, community in a mining village in you know, middle England. And um, 
News was coming out around the 40th anniversary of the liberation of the camps that parts of the film that Sidney Bernstein had um, filmed uh, and put together with Alfred Hitchcock immediately after the Second World War were going to be seen through a documentary called A Painful Reminder. Um, it would be stretching it a little if I was to say that I'm only on this call because of that film, but it was definitely a stepping stone for me to understand how important it was to confront that past. I'd grown up in a, in a, in a Britain where we'd sort of stood behind um, our involvement in the Second World War and justified our non-confrontation with the Holocaust, um, a little bit like the, the British Tommies that you see in the film saying, now I know what I was fighting for. And then what happened is we then allow that to just disappear into the past. And then we win the victory, and the victory then absolves us of responsibility to confront the reality of what the Holocaust really meant. And actually that was, I didn't realize at that point in time how constructed that was by the British government who had turned off the production of the documentary, uh, the factual survey of uh, the concentration camps, which we just was hearing about a moment ago, because in fact they were factual and because in fact they did not want to confront that past um, and did not want to confront the German population with that past. And so it was literally buried in a vault in London. That actually was an act of denial in its own right, and it was a purposeful act of government to deny that past, or at least not to confront that past, which meant my generation didn't have the benefit of confronting it or knowing about it. So in 1984, when that first documentary came out, um, we saw Sidney Bernstein on there, a little clip from that documentary a few moments ago. Um, it, was, it was a very vivid moment um, in my life um, as I saw that documentary. Same time, around about the same time, Claude Lanzmann um, uh, produced the nine hour documentary Shoah, in which we started to see the voices and hear, see the sights of Holocaust survivors telling their stories too. I share that because I think today, uh, and as we look back over these 75 years, um, it's really about what did, does that film mean to our world in which we live today? How does a confrontation with it really matter? And what I think Sidney Bernstein understood is um, that you ha that the visual is so vitally important in, a, in an age when the visual was not as accessible to people. Um, still, he understood if you didn't see it with your own eyes, it was unbelievable. You could not imagine those scenes at Bergen-Belsen if you didn't record them and at Dachau and at Ebensee and all the other places that formed the part of this final uh, documentary. And so he understood very well that the visual was going to play a very important part in pushing back the tide of denial. And at a time, as Roger was just saying right now, where the issue of um, fake news has become just a part of our daily routine, what Bernstein uh, wanted to ensure was that the Holocaust did not become some kind of fake news that you could manipulate. You would have to confront it with all of its brutality based on what the camera saw and said. I'm extremely grateful to your father, Jane, uh, for what he did. As a historian of the Holocaust and of genocide, I know that what he documented was not about the past, what it was really about all of our futures. And if, it's, if anything is a painful reminder, it is in fact that human beings can go to these lengths and that we have to guard against that in our future, which is just as well that we have Clara Citron here with us. Um, because just like your family represents three generations, Jane, it's such a privilege to have Clara on today because in the last decade that I've been in the United States, I've gotten to know her family and since she was just a young woman growing up and now here she is, a junior NYU and uh, really part of the next generation of those that are here to remind us. Clara, thank you for being on. I, I've just got to call out your grandmother just for a second. I know you're going to talk to her, but you have the best grandma ever. And uh, I know that she's in Sweden today. And is, uh, um, I, But I just want to say, I'm part of the show foundation. We had the privilege just a few weeks ago of interviewing your grandmother for five days in the Swedish language so that she could tell her story for future generations to her own um, uh, to her own country and to the future generation of Swedish young people growing up. And uh, so, so thrilled and so grateful to her. So when you speak to her, please pass her our very best. And I'm handing over to you now, Clara Citron. 
Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I'm honored and humbled to speak here this evening. And I agree, I have the best grandmother in the world. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Clara Citron, and I am a junior at New York University, where I'm studying nutrition and dietetics. New York City has always held a very special place in my heart. Um, I loved it so much that after growing up here for 18 years, I decided to stay for college too. I couldn't leave. I was born and raised on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and attended Jewish day school for 15 years. And as the granddaughter of three Holocaust survivors, Holocaust education and its history have always played an integral role in shaping my Jewish identity. And I believe that my parents did an impeccable job at making sure my siblings and I understood its severity. For as long as I can remember, conversations about the Holocaust permeated my life. Whether it was observing Holocaust Remembrance Day at school or in Israel, or closely studying the war and its aftermath and repercussions in high school, or speaking at length with my grandparents about their stories and trauma, to me, the Holocaust was always history. Anti-Semitism was always spoken about through a historical lens. And for most of my life, I was blessed with the ignorance of not realizing that anti-Semitism was and still is very much alive. I was able to proudly walk the streets of New York City on Friday nights to synagogue um, where I would be wearing a Star of David necklace and my dad would walk beside me wearing a kippah or a skull cap, um, wishing a Shabbat Shalom to other Jews on the street without ever thinking twice about our safety. But Unfortunately, we all know the sad truth that this is not the case for most Jews in 2020 and has not been for a long time. And it wasn't until my later high school years that my Jewish bubble seemed to burst. And I too lived in fear of coming face to face with anti-Semitism. It felt like every day I would wake up and there would be a new bomb threat or a shooting, a KKK rally or swastikas painted on Jewish gravestones. I was well aware of the rampant anti-Semitism that was spreading like wildfire across college campuses. And I was scared to step out of my Jewish enclave and into the real world. However, my fear and anxiety quickly subsided after a trip to Poland in April, 2018, when I had the privilege of visiting auschwitz Birkenau with my grandmother. I was one of many teenagers who journeyed to Poland to commemorate Holocaust Remembrance Day with a program called March of the Living. Once I decided to go, I called up my grandma and apprehensively asked her to join me, to which she courageously said yes. It was the first time my grandmother had returned to Auschwitz since her imprisonment at the age of 13. Together, we walked from Auschwitz to Birkenau, holding Israeli flags and unabashedly taking pride in our Judaism. My grandmother's bravery oftentimes leaves me at a loss for words and with tears in my eyes. She had the strength to return to a place that she was never supposed to leave. She walked around Birkenau sharing her story as if she were our tour guide, pausing in front of the bathroom as she recounted one horrifying night where she was forced to hide inside of a defecation hole in order to escape being killed. The deep anger, sadness, and fear that I feel in 2020 upon hearing that nearly two thirds of adults ages 18 to 39 believe the Holocaust was exaggerated, a myth, or didn't even know that it happened at all is, it's truly unparalleled. And unfortunately, upon hearing that statistic, I was neither shocked nor surprised. I feel an immense amount of responsibility to work so that those statistics reach 0%, not only for the Jewish people, but for all people who have experienced or are experiencing discrimination and genocide. And regardless of anyone's religion, race, or nationality, I think as Elie Wiesel said, best for the dead and the living, we must bear witness. Thank you very much, uh, Clara. Um, 
Now, uh, Lena, if we could hear from you, please. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jane, for inviting me um, to speak. I think you and I met in 2006, I believe, and it was in the context of storytelling around Darfur. Um, so um, my entire practice, um, my company, this Creative Impact Experience Lab, has been dedicated to the use of narrative in human rights advocacy. And part of that has be was because I grew up um, the child of immigrants and I heard stories about India's independence and partition. I also grew up right next to the Jewish Community Center, the JCC, and so was able to hear stories growing up around um, the Holocaust and people who had firsthand experience around that. And in my own lifetime, I've seen the unfolding of atrocity after atrocity after atrocity. This lives with us. So I remember Rwanda was the first one that I remember um, as an adult and then worked directly on Darfur and now work on questions around the Northern Triangle and what's happening at the US-Mexico border or in Myanmar or in Syria or in India or in and, and, and. And what I think is beautiful about your commemoration of the 75th anniversary of liberation, but also of this film is that there's a lesson here for all of us as we confront um, ongoing atrocities and as we confront what Roger was talking about, which is this very dangerous time of rapid disinformation and the need to preserve memory and prevent future atrocity. So I wanted to, I wanna make sure that I talk about why documentation like this is important and why the shaping of narrative around this documentation is important. Um, and what I think what I think these kinds of films, what this kind of film particular, particularly does, is it shows us a lived experience, right? We are at risk in a, in a highly media saturated world. We're always at risk of just relying on data and data points. This shapes, this tells us that everyone has a story, that everyone matters, that one part of, of allowing atrocity to happen is, is othering and dehumanization. And these kinds of documents help us remember that, that everyone matters, right? Um, and it also allows us to sort of fill out the political and social context with the effects on people. When I think about these kinds of stories, there is a past element, right? We need to talk about accountability and justice for past atrocity. We need to talk about preservation of memory. Um, and also an informed populace. Like we, we need to have critical thinking around these things. But in the present moment as well, there's, and especially at a time of rising xenophobia and, um, and rapid disinformation, dissemination, we need to witness. Right? We need to witness for empathy. We need to witness to make sure that we are always acknowledging people who are, people who powers that be are trying to other. Um, and then to mobilize people, right? Mobilize people for prevention and for accountability. Um, and I would say also to shock us out of complacency. Um, this record that your father did, Jane, I think you can't be complacent if you've been exposed to it. And I think we need to be, we need to be attentive all the time. So that's, I'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you very much, Lena. Uh, Lena, I think I'll start with you um, as I pose a few questions. And could I ask you all to be fairly succinct in your answers? Otherwise, we will very soon run out of time. Uh, Lena, you're, you're in the business of storytelling, and you're in the business of storytelling to create emotional impact. And we've heard from those alarming numbers from Clara, and I think in the same survey, 11% of Americans said they thought Jews were responsible for the Holocaust. Uh, how do, when there's so much else going on, um, and we are at 75 years, what kind of stories would you tell and where in order to ensure that the events portrayed in German concentration camps factual survey are not forgotten? Schools, um, civic education, um, other means, media, uh, what would you do? I mean, I would, I would do all of it. I think what's important to remember is that there are many different kinds of distribution channels and many different kinds of ways to reach people. Mm -hmm. And what's most important is to reach people where they are, right? So what you wanna do is make sure that you are hitting schools, you're hitting 
as young as possible if you can. Right. Um, hitting um, community centers, hitting you know streaming services, all of that. But the most important thing is for the story to be as responsive and relevant to the affected community as possible and make sure that their, their voices are preserved, not sort of the outside voice, and also that it's as human as possible. So when I work with kind of activist storytelling, the more activist it is, the less useful it is, honestly, because it's, it's, it's not as engaging. And so it needs to be as human as possible. Clara, what are the attitudes you encounter at NYU among your contemporaries? Is there much interest um, in, in the Holocaust, in, uh, in what happened to your grandmother and so intimately concerns you? Or is, are most people uh, either oblivious or dismissive? Um, unfortunately, I would love to um, be able to say that most people have a deep care and interest um, for the Holocaust and its atrocities. However, there is um, a large feeling amongst Jewish students of fear because of the rising anti-Semitism, especially at NYU. There is a lot of anti-Zionism, which is very loudly expressed and not at all um, condemned by the school. And I don't think that there are enough measures taken in order to commemorate um, the victims of the Holocaust and to protect Jewish students. Thank you. Um, Stephen, um, there's a lot of talk today um, about the 1930s and about a possible recurrence even, and a lot of analogies drawn between what we've seen going on politically in the United States today and some of what happened uh, with the rise of fascism in Europe. How worried are you and how justified do you feel these analogies are? Uh, you're muted. Uh, Roger, you know, history doesn't repeat itself. Um, so we shouldn't be looking for direct analogies and saying, well, because this happened in 1935 and therefore that's, that's the same as what we're seeing right now. It's not the same. What we do know is though that the causes um, and consequences of violent societies do follow patterns. Um, and I think we have to be extremely alert to those patterns. And one of them is um, polarization and extremism within democracies does not mean that a democracy uh, will make good choices. In fact, uh, as we saw in Weimar Republic, uh, the German, uh, Germany was a democracy and because of increasing polarization between uh, right and left, between the National Socialists and the Communists, um, th an extremely bad decision was made um, by I know, a third of the population of Germany. <laughs> Yes, um, and that, that might have been justified in their minds in terms of protecting their own interests, but it certainly didn't serve um, the, the long-term interests of Germany. One of the things that I, I'm always alert to, Roger, was, a, there was a, a, an amazing guy by the name of Armin Wegner, and he'd blown the whistle on the Armenian genocide in the 19 uh, teens, 1917 and 18, um, and then had written a book, actually the same year that Hitler, Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, um, about totalitarianism in, in the, the new Soviet Union. Um, and then he was, in, he was in Munich in 1933, and he was able to write a letter to Adolf Hitler the day after the anti-Semitic um, boycott of Jewish businesses on the 1st of April, 1933, and said, what you did to the Jews of Germany, you did to me as a German. And everyone who is uh, free thinking and open-minded like me, will, we will rise up and we will stop you. And if not, Germany will never live down this day ever in history again. So he, if one person could see that and see their social responsibility and speak to it, then there was a possibility that many more could. But it never happened. And in fact, uh, he's the only person that was recognized by Israel as righteous among the nations who never saved any Jewish people because he's the only person on record saying at that time, stop in my name. And I think I look for in history, I look for those examples as to where people did the right thing so that we can say, well, what do we do to have influence in the right way in our society? Not try and predict it, but just do the right thing that's in front of us. Lena, to what do you attribute the rise of xenophobia, not only in the United States, but across Europe and, and really across the world? I mean, when the, the Berlin Wall fell and liberalism seemed to be spreading, uh, everybody assumed that the, the democracy was 
ascendant and would continue to be. Open societies would thrive. Uh, and instead, um, 30 years on, uh, we see liberalism threatened. We see the rise of more and more autocratic rulers and a rise in xenophobia. Why this xenophobia today? Well, I don't know how to answer that succinctly, um, but you'll have to try. I'll have to try. And, and as a progressive, I guess I would say you know one of the one of the um, issues is authoritarians um, such as Modi, such as Duterte, such as Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro uh, taking advantage of cracks and polarization, as we discussed, right? And they're what they're what they've been doing on the one hand is taking advantage. And, and othering people and telling the dominant culture that those people are the problem and they're exploiting that. And so to me, especially as a storyteller, what I'm looking at is, is very toxic narratives that have been disseminated sometimes by mainstream media um, that, are, that are seeding the ground for increasing xenophobia, increasing other, othering. Um, we can talk about things like economic anxiety. We can talk about climate change, we can talk about a number of different, you know, intersection, intersecting issues. From my perspective as a storyteller and, you know, relating back to the to this panel particularly, um, there has been the exploitation of a narrative of othering, which makes this a very dangerous time indeed, when we talk, when we think about the Weimar period, or when we think about right, right before Rwanda. Um, when we think about these things about how language is being used and how how narrative frames are being used to create these divisions and to dehumanize, we have to be extremely vigilant. Well, Clara, you're of the social media generation. You must be very much at home with all forms of social media. Um, how difficult do you think it is to distinguish truth from lies, fact from fiction, um, as you scroll through your Twitter feed or whatever it is. Um, and do you think your generation has a solid grip on what the distinction is? That's a really good question. Thank you, Roger. Um, I, I, I think it's almost impossible to distinguish fact from fiction. Almost impossible mm -hmm. these days. Um, because? Largely because there are so many different versions of history that are being told. Um, and there are so many people who have made it their work and goal to have their version of a story told in their, in a way that matches their political ideology, um, that they're often willing to take great lengths to get people to believe them, even if they're lies. And as, social media is so influential and you can't really escape it. Um, and it gives anyone the ability to say anything. Um, it's very hard to know what, if we're reading is, is the truth or not. Um, and so we really need dedicated journalists right now who are willing to unearth the truth. Um, and that's why I, one of the reasons why I think preserving testimony is so important. Organizations like the USC Shoah Foundation that have mm -hmm. countless testimonies of survivors are so important. And I wish everyone in the world would watch them. Um, once you see someone who's experienced such trauma, speak about it firsthand, you really can't deny that. Thank you. You mean pe people have, have given up Clara, to some degree on, on facts. They just, everyone has their own facts and, and that's, that's it. I mean, if you wanted to counter this fact that, or at least it appears from a survey that 11% of Americans believed in reality that Jews were responsible for the Holocaust, uh, where would you begin? I would begin by, you know, I know that that's not the truth and we have proof of what happened during the Holocaust. Um, and thankfully we have been able to preserve these stories and we have footage um, like that of Jane's father who captured amazing, that has an amazing documentary about the sheer horrors of what happened. And so I think when you have 
proof like that, it's almost impossible to deny, but the concern comes with, comes from the access that people have, or I should say the lack of access to these, to these documentaries and videos and stories. Um, and not enough people teach the Holocaust, not enough people even know about it. And so when you have a whole generation of people who aren't really learning about it or being told about it, I think that's when these alternative facts and conspiracy theories start to gain traction. Roger, could I leap in and just give a, just an alternative view to Clara's a little bit? Yeah. Um, because um, on, on my day-to-day -day work at the Shoah Foundation, um, you know, we, we work with a lot of teachers and, and schools. Um, there was, a, there was a, at the same time the survey came out that we, you referenced, uh, there was a survey done um, of a program called Echoes and Reflections, which is a national Holocaust education program. And um, we discovered among four-year um, college undergraduates that 80% of them had done Holocaust education at school. Now, interestingly, among them, uh, among that 20% that did not, um, there were high levels of ignorance and exactly this, the point that Clara points out, that there's going to be a group of people around her at NYU who didn't have Holocaust education and have exactly those points of view that she's encountering. But we also did find out through this survey that those that did do Holocaust education at school ha have a much higher level of empathy than those that did not. Now we've been we've been waiting to try and find this out for quite a while um, because there's always been an assumption that Holocaust education was of value to the next generation. And I see a number of the participants today are commenting on the importance of Holocaust education. Um, I think Clara, your point is absolutely right. That's where we need to put our focus because if you don't have that, if you don't have that basis of understanding which Sidney Bernstein uh, Bernstein understood needed to be there, and if you don't put that across to young people, they aren't going to know. But I don't think a lot of this is willful ignorance. I think it's just a failure in our education system to put put the, the right material in front of the young people that we have the responsibility to teach. But I am seeing a very good and positive uptick in terms of the use of the resources, for example, the Shoah Foundation produces, um, running to millions and millions of extra young people using our resources every year. So I, I think it's not all, all about, the trend is not all in the wrong direction. I think the question is, how do we maintain that? How do we grow it? And how do we make use of that opportunity um, to provide those young people with the tools that, that Clara pointed out are missing in their ability to, to separate fact from fiction. Thank you, Stephen, for that hopeful note. Just very quickly, really in a couple of sentences, because we've got to move to the next stage of this, Stephen. Uh, you've seen, I don't know how many movies about the Holocaust, uh, features, documentaries, you name it. Um, what is it about German concentration camps, factual survey, that you think is distinctive, that is peculiar to it, and that makes it a document unlike any other? Immediacy. The immediacy of him being right there as it unfolded with his camera and the undeniability of the images that you see there. Thank you. Um, Clara, uh, how can we make sure that young people learn about the Holocaust and are not at risk for apathy, of apathy or denial? You've answered that to some degree, but let me ask you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that we have to really work hard to preserve these stories and to make sure, like Stephen was saying, that we um, are able to fill the holes in the education system. And also, I think that it's important to be able to connect with people of my generation um, and their understanding that while the Holocaust was the mass persecution of the Jewish people and other minority groups as well, the Holocaust was not a an only a Jewish issue, it was a humanitarian issue. And I think that goes for any um, instance of discrimination against any people. It doesn't just, you know, it's not just important to, the, to those whom the oppressors are targeting, it's important for everyone. I think you I think you wanted to mention a video contest. Is that right? Yes. Um, part of third generation's commemoration is their video contest. Um, the seventy fifth anniversary is so significant. It couldn't be a more relevant moment for my generation to think about 
what fascism can unfurl. The contest is a great opportunity for anyone, not only aspiring filmmakers, to try their hand at making a video to help out a great cause and share the truth. I'm going to let my friends at NYU and from high school know about it and promote it across my campus, and I hope others will do the same. I'm happy to be a part of this effort and to be on the jury. And Jane is going to detail some of the specifics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, the video contest is really an essential part of our commemoration because it's the way that we want to bring the message of my father's film to young people and to encourage their unique creativity to raise awareness of crimes against humanity at this moment in time through the media that they are comfortable and familiar with. It's gonna run from tomorrow until December 31st and we're building an amazing jury of artists and film industry um, professionals, which will be chaired by Marilyn Minter. Um, they're gonna be three cash prizes of $1,000. And through our partner, Manemsha Films, the shortlisted and winning videos will be entered into film festivals around the world. So, um, and all the finalists will be shared on social media. So these videos will be seen far and wide. And um, I'm really excited about this initiative because it really takes the inspiration of my father's film and makes it contemporary for young people today. Um, so um, I was thinking, Roger, maybe now we can see if we have some questions from, from the audience. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Do come ahead. Uh, and, but while we're sort of thinking about that, I, I did want to, can I just say a couple of things myself about education? You know, it's, I think it's very easy for us today to, to look particularly at the United States and see failures in the education system around the Holocaust and, and, and these issues. Um, but I have to say, as somebody who had what was considered to be an exemplary education in the United Kingdom, we were not taught about the Holocaust in my school. And I've been reconnecting with schoolmates uh, coincidentally in the last few weeks and was amazed to discover that so so many of them or several of them were the children of Holocaust survivors. And I didn't know. And that was something that was never discussed when we were young. So even if you have, you know, the best education that money can buy or some equivalent of that, does not mean that you are taught the history that has gone immediately before you. Um, and I think that it's really important to recognize that as individuals, we have a responsibility to not only educate ourselves, but to be open to understanding history differently, perhaps than the way we were taught it. And- um, Well, this is the same mentality, Jane, that produced what Stephen alluded to at the beginning, which is yeah. the suppression of German concentration camps, actual yeah. survey. It was suppressed for decades. And when you see that film, you have to ask yourself, why? Well, there were all kinds of political reasons. It was important to begin to yeah. build a relationship with post-war Germany and so on. All kinds of specious reasons. I will just given. Yeah. hold up here. The basic fact was it was an embarrassment and more than an embarrassment. Yeah. So um, yeah. we have to be very wary of the suppression of facts. Yeah. And whenever I've been in a war zone, be it Bosnia or in Lebanon, uh, I felt that the most important thing was to set it down in the moment, in words, be there. Uh, because as time goes by, people start to tell different stories and try to persuade you that they're true. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so um, a lot of the a lot of the questions um, seem to be comments more than that, but. Um, Can I jump in for one second then? Sure, right. Lena, come in. Yeah, so I want to I want to talk a little bit about immediacy. And I know um, I, in particular, particular, have been very critical of social media lately uh, for the last five years or so when things have started crashing. And you see the role, the documented role of Facebook and Myanmar, for example. Um, but one of the things I think that social media has done, and if we can learn how to preserve this as documented record, it allows people an avenue to document their own situation in real time. So when you do see sort of like Rohingya Twitter, or when you see, you know, immigration Twitter, or you see there, there are just these little, you know, different parts of 
of social media that are documenting their own situations in real time. There's power in that. There's immediacy in that. And I think, you know, as we start grappling with how we document, how we shape narrative and how we preserve memory, we have to look at, even, in, even among the, the, amidst the criticism that we have, the very valid criticism of social media, we have to look at the power of the distribution channel that we've got. And how does that, how do we use that? And how do we leverage that for prevention and for accountability and for empathy? Hmm. Yeah. I think if, if I could build on that as a little bit as well, um, the Show Foundation, you know, we, we have the, the collection of testimonies of 55,000 testimonies that were collected, um, you know, originally by Steven Spielberg um, and now part of the University of Southern California. Um, we've layered into that now uh, 10 other genocides, um, going back to Armenia at the beginning of the 20th century, all the way up to uh, what happened in Myanmar just a few years ago and taking, you know, drawing from um, Sidney Bernstein's uh, example, um, being in Bangladesh as they're coming off the boats, literally, and interviewing them right there and then for that exact immediacy. Um, but also, I think uh, you're just making a really great point, Lena, about how we use the different channels that are available to us. Uh, we've just launched uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, a, a virtual reality film called The Last Goodbye, which uh, allows you to go to one of the concentration camps. And uh, I was you know, pleased to produce that a few years ago. And subsequently, we've just launched that for free on Oculus so that actually we can use that distribution channel that currently was not really available to us um, mm -hmm. to get to those people who, are, who do, um, you know, consume virtual reality media. I think that you're absolutely right, Lena. We've got to find all sorts of ways in to try and tell our story for the generation that's uh, emerging, but also with the technologies that we have. They also see there's a question about how do you, you know, engage young people when they're at home. And one of the technologies we've developed is this uh, interactive technology to be able to ask Holocaust survivors questions, which is exactly what Clara's grandmother, Elizabeth Citrom, did in, in Sweden a few weeks ago, um, allowing then deeper levels of engagement, I think the, the commentate, commenter there was right. You know, it's, it can be a little overwhelming, a little boring to students to just sit and watch video after video after video. But when you're asking the questions, then the pedagogy is different because you're actually driving the conversation. So we're just trying to find different ways to do that sort of uh, levels of engagement, Roger. Yeah, and I have to say the um, Shoah Foundation has been sort of exemplary in this. The, the experience of, of both those um, options is remarkable. Um, can so we, Jane, do you have anything from the outside world? I do, I do. Um, I'm going to read through some without any. How do we get through to the American public about human rights abuses taking place? Well, don't read too many. I mean, okay, yeah, okay. Um, don't read too many. I'm going to, well, I mean, otherwise we won't be able to answer them. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm just going to give you one at a time. Yeah. How do we get through to the American public about human rights abuses taking place in other countries when international news is scarcely, if ever, covered here by cable news? Who would like to take that? Lena. Sure. I mean, I think it's, I think it's a two-way street. One is the international news is out there if you go looking for it. Um, that's, uh, that's one of those personal responsibility questions that I always hate to take on, but it's true. Like there is, there is enough, um, there is media saturation around international issues at the moment. And there are some amazing nonprofit outlets anywhere from rest of world to the Polis project. Like they're who are looking at these things and you know what I'll do to, I'll, I'll send you a list Jane of like where the outlets are right now. But on the other hand, I think, um, I think it is um, incumbent now on American media to start broadening. Like one of the problems I think that's happened um, in this administration, it's been happening, is this, this notion of exceptionalism. That what happens here is, is what we should be thinking about. Everything's about America all the time. And we are, I mean, we still, even in a time of falling influence, we are extremely influential around the, around the world. And I think it's our responsibility um, in the media to tell stories of other places, but more importantly, to listen to stories of other places and make sure that that distribution is happening. Um, and so I think it's a combination of curiosity and search and also responsibility of the media to broaden its mandate. I think it's striking that foreign policy in, the, uh, in this presidential election has really not come up at all. If it has, it's 
it's the president accusing China of being responsible yeah. for the virus and for various other things. Um, and I think we haven't used the word virus in this um, coronavirus in the whole debate, but I think the fracturing effect this is having on the world is very acute and perhaps makes it even more difficult to identify with what's happening in Belarus yeah. or, or elsewhere. It makes witnessing very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, which, you know, actually, there's a question here. How do we engage middle and high school students during COVID? Most won't sit and watch videos and, um, and we aren't able to send speakers to the schools. Um, the, boom, the question has come up. Well, I think, Clara, you should take that. Um, okay, I mean, I'm not an educator um, in any way, shape, or form, but I, I think that, you know, it's even since we can't bring speakers into schools, it's even more important for teachers to try their best to get students to listen and, and feel engaged in a exciting way, like as Stephen was talking about um, with the ability to ask questions um, with the, the last goodbye. It's a, a more engaging way of learning about the Holocaust than maybe watching a documentary um, or listening to a testimony. So I think utilizing those resources are really important. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, there's another question here which follows on quite nicely from that. Does it help or hinder to reduce Holocaust ignorance by drawing parallels with other more recent atrocities? Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia, Myanmar. Stephen. I'll tell you that uh, in the Show Foundation's uh, programming, we have a, a, a platform called Eyewitness, um, and we don't make a distinction between the, the, the personal experiences that are um, being discussed there. Obviously, if the lesson is about Auschwitz and it's going to be about uh, you know the, the mass murder of European Jewry, but if it's going to be about propaganda, it could be about propaganda across the ages and, and across in a, in a variety of different contexts. So um, the way in which we do this is we never compare human suffering, but the causes and consequences do need to be understood. And, and where there is, uh, you know, the teachable lessons that we can learn from one to the other, in fact, they do support this understanding of universality and a common uh, humanity. And that only helps us because when we sort of talk about, well, it's my suffering and it's his suffering and it's her suffering, actually that just creates these silos of suffering which actually don't bring us together where we can share those stories and when we hear the common humanity, I think that's a really good way to, uh, from an educational point of view, not to blur the lines. Actually, we need to teach them the literacy around how to understand the uh, you know, history for what it is in each of those cases. Um, but it also treats us as a sort of empathy that can cross cut all of our shared experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, it's some of the comments here ha, have been quite disturbing and astonishing to, I mean, to me. Um, but here we are. Can you say in what way? Uh, you know, they're just as, as um, what I would consider to be deeply anti-Semitic and disrespectful comments that are coming from people who haven't listened to the conversation and see it as an opportunity to, um, you know, to to ascribe lies to, to, you know, to Jews and worse. And I think that- well, that, I think, illustrates very vividly yeah. Uh, yeah. the urgency of, of this discussion. Yes, I think it does. Um, there's a question here for Roger. How much do you think a win by Joe Biden can shift the current anti-Semitism in the US? Well, I think ground zero of this election is decency. We have to restore decency to our body politic. And that has to begin at the top. And I think as long as um, the incumbent is there, uh, we're going to get a relentless daily show of indecency. We know that. And um, so I believe that if on November 3, Joe Biden is elected president, then um, he will begin to steer the country uh, in a concerted fashion away um, from the hatred, xenophobia, and all the rest that uh, Donald Trump has used because his means of survival has been to divide the country. 
Uh, Anti-Semitism is one of those forms of hatred. Uh, it's growing more virulent again. Uh, it's a very, very extreme form of indecency and its culmination was, was the Holocaust. Um, so I do believe he can make a difference, yes. It's not gonna go away, it hasn't gone away for millennia. Uh, it's out there, but recent times have enabled and empowered these people to feel that they can do what they've just done, um, send you insults, Jane. Yeah. So I think there will be slowly some change. Yeah, we have to hope. Okay, well, I think that um, it's probably, um, you know, time to um, to wind this up a bit. Um, and although I, you know, I do want to thank everyone who's joined the live stream today. Um, and um, even those who have joined to be critical and hateful, um, I think that um, hopefully some of the skeptics will come away with a little bit more of an understanding of, of what it is to, you know, to have empathy in this world. Um, and, you know, for the rest of the listeners, it has been an honor to have you here. And I hope that um, everyone now considers themselves to be part of the three generations community. Um, we have um, in our small way covered genocides from the Armenian genocide to to um, the one in Myanmar in a much much smaller way but we do always rely on the power of storytelling and individual stories and we have tried over the <clears throat> 12 years to sort of cross pollinate the you know different issues that we think are issues of social injustice um, sometimes in ways people find a little um, disconnected, but I feel that there is always a common thread where there's lack of empathy, there is a space to tell important stories. Um, so I encourage everyone, um, including the, the doubters, to visit our website and follow Three Generations on social media. That's where you can find out what we're up to. Um, and if you're under 30, I truly encourage you to enter the video contest. You have nothing to lose and so much to gain, and we do want to hear your voices. Um, German concentration camps, factual survey can be streamed on from our website for your personal viewing and licensed for educational and community streaming through the films. Um, and, um, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done to make this world more equitable, as we can all see. Um, and at Three Generations, we will continue to produce the truth and share important stories as long as we are able. So naturally donations are welcomed and appreciated. But lastly, I want to thank this remarkable panel who joined me today, who were all wonderful. It means a lot to me personally. It means a lot to three generations as an organization. And I know that Sydney would be grateful and honored to have had all of you here. So thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank I lost my parents and my four sisters. Cultural genocide. I started when I was 11 years old. If I just disappeared, the ones would have to Cultural science. Why shouldn't the world know about this? No, please, back up, back up, back up. To sell myself for $30 is pretty sad. What you do to your land, to your water, to your air, that comes full circle at some point. I said, I'm afraid of the destruction. I mean, I'm afraid of the destruction. I'm afraid of the Soon the fire will die, the smoke and ashes will drift away, and grass will cover the place. So we went from it being illegal one night, and now it's a constitutional right. Parents or uncles having to go out into the woods and cut their 12-year-old down from the tree. Every day, hundreds of millions of tons of icebergs carve off the glaciers. The state of Louisiana fought for 30 years to execute Mr. Ford. People as smugglers uh, 
are just heartless people, although they are human beings. They only care about money. Shooting rockets. Hostile environments profoundly unjust. One million people could die in 100 days. I think what they're trying to do is just keep us apart. We have, we have so much dysfunction. Native Americans have some of the worst mortality. Rate. What's instilled in your mind of what you've experienced, what you witnessed, that's the enemy.